Hey guys, welcome to Ignite, uh, another edition of Ignite Online, and we get to talk about another hero today. And so excited about it. Um, I know, and you know, especially this hero, this is a this is actually a uh, a story or a character that I've. I've known for a really long time, and the story that I'm going to tell is not that known of a story, but I love this story. Um, but just before we get there, um, well, lots of stuff happening this last week, and uh, maybe not affecting our teenagers as much as you guys took the hit a couple weeks ago when you went to online learning. Uh, more for the adults, and so there's lots of complaining and moaning <laughs> going on. Uh, me too, like it's, it's hard. This is not uh, what we had envisioned uh, for our our Christmas, uh, Christmas break, uh, but it, it is what it is. Uh, so uh, today's story is hopefully a little bit of a, a pick-me-up, and um, yeah, it, I'm, I'm excited to, to talk about it. So our hero for today is going to be Elisha. Um, and you can find our story in 2 Kings chapter 6, and uh, you, can, you can turn there in your Bibles. We'll get there in a minute. Um, so a little bit about history about Elisha. Well, who was Elisha? Well, he was a prophet in Israel in the 8th century BC. Uh, he was the protege of Elijah, probably the most famous of the prophets. And so uh, some people don't even realize that there's another prophet because his name, maybe it's because his name is so similar to, a, right after Elijah, his name is Elisha, right? And so that can be a little bit, uh, yeah, I think he's a little bit forgotten at times. Uh, and yet the ministry of Elisha was just, it was incredible. Um, lots of really cool stuff. And so um, he followed Elijah. In fact, he even got to witness Elijah being taken up. The famous story of Elijah being taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. Like, that would have been incredible, right? It's like, wow, amazing. And uh, uh, Elijah throws his cloak over the side as he goes up into heaven, and uh, Elisha picks it up as this really important symbolism of Elijah uh, Elisha, uh, I'm going to mix them up today a little bit maybe, uh, picking up the cloak and like as a symbolism of him picking up uh, where Elijah has left off. In fact, one of the cool things about Eli Elisha, a couple things. Uh, the first is that uh, Elisha asked God for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. Now, if you know the story of Elijah, Amazing. So many just crazy things happening in Elijah's life, like him outrunning chariots, uh, the big fiasco on uh, Mount Carmel uh, where God sends fire down from heaven. And like this is all these amazing stories of Elijah, uh, one of the most famous prophets. In fact, even in the New Testament, there's an appearance of Elijah in the transfiguration on the mountain with Jesus, right? And yeah, <laughs> anyway, he's, he's one of the most famous. And so this, this, this character, Elisha, sometimes maybe has, uh, um, gets mixed up with him a little bit or is maybe a little bit forgotten, because, maybe because of his name, uh, but mostly because of he's in the shadow of Elijah. But just amazing stuff that, that Elisha does in, during his life, and, and it's really incredible. Uh, so he asked for a double portion, and what that means, it, at first, like, when I first heard it, I just thought that that meant that he wanted twice as much of the Spirit as Elijah. I'm like, wow, uh, how is that even possible? Uh, but that's not what he's asking. Uh, so a double portion would be, uh, like, in, in those days, the firstborn son would receive a double portion of the inheritance, and then all the rest of the sons and daughters or whatever, or sons, I guess, would split all the rest, um, but he would get a double portion. And so... It's, it is really just this symbolism that Elisha is saying to God, I, I want to carry on after Elijah. I want, to, I want to take that role on. And so really, really kind of neat. And, and so here's, here's some of the stuff that happens in Eli Elisha's life. <laughs> I just keep wanting to say Elijah. I don't want to. <laughs> so Elisha. So in Elisha's life, here's, here's some of the things that are just amazing stories. So there's uh, one story of, uh, it's called the feeding of 100. And so Maybe more than any other prophet, the prophet Elisha seems to foreshadow Jesus in some really specific ways. And of course, the feeding of the, of the 100 men uh, in 2 Kings um, reminds us of the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospels, right? Or the feeding of the 4,000 in the Gospels that Jesus feeds these people. And so it's a very similar situation. There's not enough food. There's these loaves of bread come in. Um, and uh, Elisha says to them, you know, feed, feed it to the men. And they're like, this little bit of bread isn't going to make it. Like, these, these are, these are full-grown men. And, El, and Elisha says, 
uh, they will eat, or the Lord says, they will eat and have some left over. So really, um, like a stark picture of what would happen in the New Testament with Jesus, right? That there'd be actually baskets of food left over after he fed the people. And that's exactly what happened. The men, the hundred men ate, and there was food left over. Uh, another, another significant uh, sign or wonder um, from the prophet Elisha was the raising, uh, raising of the Shunammite boy from, from dad, from death, right? A resurrection. Like he raised this boy from the dead. Crazy story. Amazing. And I'm like, oh, wow, yeah foreshadow of Jesus, raising a little girl that was sick from the dead, uh, raising Lazarus from the dead, and ultimately, in the end, raising himself from the dead, right? This is uh, this foreshadow of Jesus, so really cool. And the last thing, there's more, but the, the last one I just want to highlight is uh, the one we just talked about two weeks ago was, was the healing of, of Naaman, who had leprosy. And so in the New Testament, we, we find over and over Jesus uh, healing lepers, uh, making the unclean clean. And so we see this happening with the, with the symbolism of this washing in the Jordan River of Naaman and cleansing of his leprosy. And so lots of symbolism, lots of foreshadowing in, in the life of, of Elisha. So now we've got to get to our story because we're already like a few, seven minutes in and we've got, we got a motor here. Uh, so you can turn to 2 Kings chapter 6 if you're not already there. And we're going to start our story in verse 8. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such, a, in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place, because the Armenians are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. Now, you can imagine how the, the enemy king uh, would have reacted, but here it is. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officials. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> it's like nothing is hidden from God, right? Nothing. Go and find where he is, the king ordered, so I, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went er out early in the next morning, the army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. What do you think Elisha's going to say? Here it comes. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw, what do you think he saw? The hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is so cool, you guys. This is amazing. He, totally unaware of what was, what was actually out there, like this, the spiritual realm that's, that's, that's at play here and how close and near it is. And it just blows this servant's mind. Can you imagine where some dude is kind of like, let me pray for you. <laughs> he prays for you. You open your eyes and all you, you see like chariots of fire, horses of fire, and you're like, what? Wow. Yeah, I guess I don't need to be afraid, right? Oh, it's one of the coolest parts of this story. All right, as, as the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. Interesting. So the opposite, right? He has just prayed that his servant can see and that the enemy army goes blind. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road, and this is not the city. <laughs> so let's just go there for a second. Wouldn't that be just like the best, uh, the best prank ever? <laughs> to be able to tell God, okay, God, 
can you just make those guys blind for a little while? Uh, I want to play a trick on them. This is the best prank ever pulled in history. This is awesome. All right, here we go. Uh, this is not the road, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will lead you to the man you're looking for. Of course, we know Elisha is that man, right? And he, and he led them to Samaria. Now, Samaria was the capital of Israel at the time. Very strong, fortified city. Um, and this was, like, this was the, their strongest of all the cities in Israel. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men's, men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked. And there they were inside Samaria. Can you imagine if you're these guys? And you're going like, you know, you're kind of, wow, wow, it's this foggy out. I can't see very well. And then uh, finally, this, this dude that you've been following, is, oh, he's a really nice guy. He's leading us right to the guy we want. Tells the praise and then boom, you can see. And you find yourself in the enemy's main city, their capital city, their stronghold. And you're like, uh, uh-oh, this isn't going to go well, right? All right, let's keep going. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Eliza, Elisha, uh, shall I kill them? My father? It's interesting, he called them my father. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> shall I kill them, he says again. He's just like, woo-hoo, look what happened. I've got all these enemy soldiers in my city, and now I can do away with them. So what do you think, what do you think they're going to do? What, what is Elisha going to say? Do not kill them. He answered, would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so they may eat and drink, then go back to their master. Now, this is interesting that he's doing this because, you know, God isn't just giving them a second chance. God knows they're going to come back. In fact, if you keep reading, they come back and they lay siege to Samaria, right? Some of those same dudes are probably in the army that comes. So it's very interesting. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. And so the bands of Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. So at, at that time, the band, there's like these bands of, of uh, uh, Armenian men coming in and raiding and taking plunder and re wreaking havoc on Israel. And so that's, that, at that point, it stopped. All right, so that's, that's where we're going we're gonna to stop in our story. Now, the story of Elisha goes on. You can read it in 2 Kings chapter 6, 7, I think 8, um, and, and actually before that as well. It's a fabulous story. Uh, so here's, here's what I want to do with uh, our remaining time. I want to talk about what this story reveals to us about God and then um, some insights from the life of Elisha. Uh, okay, so we got, I think we've got three of each. Yeah, i got three of each here. So let's go. What, what, what do we learn about God in this story? Well, the first thing that jumps out to me in this story is that nothing is hidden from God. Like, I just think it's just such an interesting thing that this, this dude, when the, when the king is kind of like, how does this guy know what, what we're planning? Every time I, I, do, I plan a trap, the king of Israel misses it. How can this be? And so some, somebody in his court knows about the God of heaven, knows about Elisha, which is interesting, right? Um, and of course, I think it's God at work, behind the scenes, orchestrating everything as he always does. That was one of our points from last week. God's behind the scenes, doing all this stuff. I think he's here too. Uh, but it's interesting. I, I just love that language, that he even knows what you say in, the, in your bedroom. Now, uh, th this is meant to portray that in the most secret place, God knows what you're saying and thinking. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> We, we often don't think about God like that. We often wonder what God's, what God's up to, or if he sees that, or if he sees this, or where are you when this happened? Um, you know, we, we often think that way, and yet it's so interesting that stories like this remind us that nothing is hidden from the sight of God. In fact, the book of Hebrews talks about that, like nothing is hidden from God. Like he sees everything. Uh, the second thing we learn about God is that he's near. Right, so that uh, not just near, that he's powerful, that his his nearness is 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 also accompanied with his power, and so we see this in the in the invisible army uh, that the servant gets to see when his eyes are opened, um, and so I just think that that is something. You know what? That's something about God. The, actually, these two things, maybe all of them, <laughs> the next one too, are something we just need to be reminded of God right now, about God right now, 
that, that he knows all of the secrets, that he knows it all, like he knows everything. And then um, that he's close, that he's right here with us. He's not far away. And he's not just not far away, but his power is incredible. Like just imagine if we could just pray right now and go, oh Lord, open our eyes that we may see what's going on around us, that we actually may, be, may see. What would we see? I think we would see something similar to the servant here, that we would see the power of God displayed all around us, um, that, he, that he is present, that he is near, that his, his power and presence is right here. And so it's interesting that the servant just got a picture of this because who else gets to see this? Like, Elisha, maybe, and that's it, right? And the, like, there's this, like, a lot of pages of, of story here in this Bible. And it's just really cool. And I think that, that this story is there for, for us for, and, and for, you know, especially in times like this where, we, where we, can, we can look and we go like, okay, our God, he's, he's, he knows everything. Like, he knows all the secrets. Um, but he's also, he's present and he's powerful. We don't need to be afraid. Um, which is, we'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. I don't want to spoil that. And uh, our, our third one, so we got God knows, knows everything. He knows our secrets. There are no secrets when it comes to God. Uh, that God is near and powerful. And then uh, last, that God is merciful to his enemies. And we, this was a theme actually we had last week. Um, in fact, in our small groups, we, we read from Romans chapter 12. Uh, it's actually a proverb. Um, Proverbs, uh, what is it? Proverbs 25, verse 21, where it says, if your enemy, enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. <laughs> and so what did the Elisha instruct the king to do? These are your enemies. Feed them. Uh, give them a drink. And then send them on their way. <laughs> All right? So it's really cool. Like God, this, is, this is who our God is, that he does this. Knowing full well that those guys would probably return in a little while as, as part of the bigger army that was going to march on Samaria. Uh, and so this is, these are, this is interesting. These are cool things that we learn about our God, that God didn't just tell us to do these things, that he does them himself. All right, so what are some lessons that we can learn from Elisha, from the life of Elisha? Well, I think the first one that kind of jumps out to me is that faith gives us eyes to see. It kind of gives us new eyes, right? I, I think that's displayed uh, with the servant, that suddenly this servant was able to see something that he had never seen before. And I just, I feel like it's just this, this picture of what happens, um, what happens when you put your faith in Jesus. Now it's interesting because uh, just, so we've been launching this whole series off of Hebrews 11 where it talks about, um, it talks about all these heroes, but also talks about the nameless people that went through so much hardship and we don't even know who they were. Uh, and yet they're all waiting for this promise that never, never was delivered during their time because it was, the, it was God was waiting so that we could join in. That the, the people of God, could be, it was something bigger than just for Israel. And I just, like that, that's what the, at, is at the end of Hebrews chapter 11. It's so cool. Um, that involved us. And then right after that, Hebrews chapter 12 uh, talks about uh, keeping your eyes on Jesus, you know, looking to him. And I think this is a picture of that, that the servant's eyes being opened is actually what happens when we look to Jesus. So in difficult times, we look to Jesus, and I think he gives us new eyes to see. I think we can see differently. Faith does something to us. And looking to Jesus, remembering him, thinking, oh yeah, my life's about him. Oh yeah, Jesus is on the throne of the universe. Oh yeah, nothing is hidden from him. Oh yeah, he has a, he has his, his power is incredible. He has like <laughs> more armies than atoms, right, in, in, the, uh, in the world. Like, he's just like, ah, oh, his power is so great. And we don't, we don't need to forget that. And so when we keep our eyes on Jesus, I think we're reminded of these things. And, you know, the sin and the things that hinder us just entangle us and, and they cause us to look away. Uh, and sometimes just to look at the stuff that's right in front of us. And it makes it difficult for us to remember who who God is and how powerful he is. So the next thing that I, I think that we can, we can learn from lessons from Elisha is that uh, we don't need to be afraid because of what we just talked about, because of remembering and keeping our eyes on Jesus. Uh, the product from that is that we don't need to fear. So, like, oh yeah, like if Jesus is on the throne of the universe, if, he, if everything is moving according to his plan towards a destined 
a, a predetermined end that Jesus has already predetermined, which is from Daniel, right, from three weeks ago. <laughs> um, we don't need to be afraid. And so when fear enters, our, our response needs to look to Jesus. We need to remember Jesus, who Jesus is, what he's done for us, the promises that he's made. The, thing, the, the way that the, earth, the world is going is all going towards this ultimate end that he's already predetermined. And so we don't need to be afraid. We find this in chapter 16. And so what is, what is or in verse 16, so what does Elisha, Elisha say to his servant? First thing he says, don't be afraid. And then shows him why he doesn't need to be afraid. And he's showed it for us too. We can, we can take these words, don't be afraid. And we keep reading, go like, oh, that's what's going on around us that we can't see. That God's powers and, and his presence is all around us. And that, that brings us to our third thing that we learn from the life of Elisha, is that we are surrounded by God's power, presence, and love. That God cares about his people is very obvious through these stories, um, ultimately ending in the greatest love story of all time, where, where God became one of us, took on human flesh, like this, this amazing God, like humbled himself to become one of us. Like he's not like us, we're like him, but he's not like us. Like, we, we are image bearers, but man, this, this unbelievable, uninhibited, unlimited God limited himself and became human. That is amazing. Like, he did that. What love. And then, not just that. So he lives this life, perfect, without sin, and then ends up dying a criminal's death for us to pay the penalty for our sin. This is amazing. What a story. He would lay down his life. And the Bible says he lays, he lays down life. He laid down his life for his friends. We're his friends. Wow, we get to be friends with the, with the, with the creator, with the, with the God of the universe. We're, God calls us his friends. Isn't that amazing? And so he's close with us. This isn't some distant being that lives way out there. And I know sometimes it feels like that. It does. I know that. I've been through lots of those times where I just felt like God was so far away. But he's not. He is close. And sometimes we, we hide from him and we get inv involved in sin and stuff that entangles us and, and we lose sight of who he is. And often those are the times where we feel far away. And sometimes we just need to feel far away from God so that we reach out for him. But the Bible on numerous occasions is like, he's not far away from any one of us. In fact, I'm thinking of, I think it's Acts 17. Where he's, not, he's not far from anyone, not just his people from any one of us. And so we are surrounded by his presence, that he is with us, that he has promised to be with us, that God has promised his people he would be with them. Jesus specifically said, I will be with you until the very end of the age. Um, like, yeah, he's with us, his presence. We do not need to fear. Um, we can have faith and we can look to Jesus and it can be a life, it can be life-saving for us. It can be life-changing for us to look to Jesus, because we are surrounded by God's power, his presence, and his love. So things are, things are difficult right now. I know they are. I feel it. Um, I haven't, you know, my last couple of weeks haven't been, <laughs> haven't been glorious. Uh, there's been some tough times. Um, and I, I do need to remind myself often, and have others speak into my life, we need to look to Jesus. We need to look to him. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the one. He is the true hero of this story, even in the story of Elisha. Jesus is the true hero. And so we need to look at him. And the darkness feels stronger than ever. Uh, it feels like it's pushing in on us. And for some of us, it even feels like it's inside of us, right? It's just spreading. It's just spreading inside of us. And we, But I, I guess if you get anything from this talk, you just... You don't have to succumb to the darkness. You don't have to let it creep into your soul. That you can look to Jesus. That there is light there. In fact, if you want to read a great passage, read John chapter 1, where it talks about Jesus being the light of men. <laughs> the light that shines. Illuminates, right? And what happens when a light turns on in a dark place? It is bathed in light. The darkness can't overcome that light, right? The light just shines and it brightens it up. And it actually chases away the darkness. But that's what Jesus does. That's why we're to, we're to keep our eyes on him, to look to him. 
The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 to keep our eyes on Jesus. He's the light we need to push back this darkness that's all around us and sometimes even in us. So let's look for Jesus, the true hero of the Bible and of our lives and of faith. Let me pray for you guys. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for these teenagers. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, I just, I love them so much. They are, they're amazing. I love seeing their faces. Um, I love interacting with them, and I just can't wait till we're all together again and I can hear them laughing and having a good time and enjoying themselves. It's going to be awesome. In the meantime, Lord, please don't let the darkness overtake us. Um, and when I say us, I mean us as a group, but also each one of us, Lord, each person here. Um, and even the ones that uh, just haven't been able to, to come on for whatever reason. Uh, Lord, I just pray that the light would shine in them, that they would, uh, you would um, draw their eyes to you and to, to get it off the, the complaining and all the other stuff that's all around us, to turn to you and to look to you. Help us to do that. I pray, Lord, they'd have a great small group tonight um, and that you would give our leaders wisdom and uh, great questions that would be asked. We just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.